I made the mistake yesterday of going to one of the presentations on uh, natural language, which is not my thing. I'm a DevOps guy. And um, my life was changed because uh, the whole view that I had of the way our Slack bot ought to work, right out the window because like there's really cool natural language things out there that are not that difficult to configure. I don't have to be a genius to make this work. I might actually be able to fix up our Slack bot to be more polite, more responsive, and more representative of people's intent. I, this is like, holy cow. And that was completely by accident. The ones that I went to on purpose were even better. <laughs> so what I really want to talk about um, actually is, um, is my home, and um, I, I have luscious pictures of, uh, of uh, Red Ranger there. So the point is that um, a bunch of years ago, like eight or so years ago, uh, my partner and I decided we were going to sell everything we owned, including the F-150 and the house and, and all the stuff, and uh, fit out a boat and go see the watery parts of the world. And my mother said, bless her heart, she lived about a mile from where we lived in rural upstate New York in the at Foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. My mother said, I'm gonna buy a boat and sail around. Don't come home. <laughs> Don't come home until you have a story. Oh, because the first 50 years of stories have been boring, frankly, Stephen, <laughs> so you better pick up the pace here. I'm getting old and I'm not waiting around for any good stuff to happen any longer. So what I want to talk about is um, sailing, because sailing is, is cool stuff. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about a particular journey that we were on in Red Ranger. And so this is the way you sort of think about the, the sailing thing. I'm trying to get from Nassau in the Bahamas to uh, Fernandina Beach in Florida. It's a 400 some odd nautical mile trip. We use nautical miles at sea. This is always a weird thing, but if you, you know, take the 360 degrees around the equator and divide each degree into 60 minutes, each of those is one nautical mile. So it's one twenty-six thousandths the, the diameter of the Earth. Uh, they're about 6,000 feet, so it's similar to a statute mile, but you read it right directly off the chart. Latitude, longitude, nautical miles, no thinking involved. So at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're not thinking very clearly, you can still read the damn chart. So this is why nautical miles are really important. Um, and we use knots, nautical miles per hour, and you'll notice the, the point up there about um, the, the speed that we're going to go at um, when you are... Uh, able to run a 5K in 22 minutes, that's about how fast the boat goes. So we are not proceeding through the ocean terribly quickly. And the consequence of that is, is that a journey of 400 odd um, nautical miles is gonna take a while. Uh, I'll save you the math. We do four hours on, four hours off watch keeping. So that means that I come on at midnight and at 4 a.m. I wake the crew member up. The crew member is there from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. And it cycles around like that through the days. And so the only human interaction you have is watch change, a, a brief shining moment where you wake the other person up, tell them what's going on, and then you immediately fall asleep because four hours on, four hours off, you're basically always a little sleep deprived. And what you wind up talking about during the watch changes, a few critical things. You know, the weather and sea state, which is like generally pretty observable, but a lot of times it changes dramatically. On this particular trip, when we left Nassau, the wind was blowing, trade winds, 20 some um, knots, um, you know, like 25 miles an hour or something like that. But by the time it was my watch, the wind had died to nothing and we had to start uh, the diesel engine to, to make the boat move at all. Uh, shipping is always a baffling mystery at sea because there's lights everywhere, especially in the Straits of Florida. And some of those lights are just cruise ships that are just idling. They, they, they drive out of Fort Lauderdale and they just hang around offshore so you can like gamble and drink and then they go back into Fort Lauderdale. They drift in the, in the, in the currents. It's a very weird thing. Others of them are fishing boats and they're pretty big operations. There's some container ships headed for the Port of Miami. All this has to be kind of sorted out and at night, they're just a bunch of lights on the horizon. They all look alike for a while, and then you, you figure it out, and then you, 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 you tell the other person when you're switching watch what exactly is going on. You know, how the boat is doing is important. Uh, how the rest of the crew is doing, 
I'm starving. What is there to eat? And, you know, oh, I just, when I, during my watch, I put a pot of rice on, so it's on the galley down there, uh, undo the lid, we use a pressure cooker, and, you know, you can have uh, hot rice stuff down in the, in the galley. So these are, you know, important little exchanges of information, and then they go to sleep. And so at midnight, the one night, I get up, and, and this is the watch change information. I smell burning diesel. That is a kind of an alarming thing. I thought we were going to talk about the weather or whether or not there was any rice to eat. I was not expecting to talk about the smell of burning diesel. So the question you have at this point is, how in goodness name can you correlate Python programming with sailboats? Are you deranged? And the answer is, perhaps I am deranged. But I do see a parallel here, and the parallel is fraught with some philosophical difficulties. Software, for instance, doesn't wear out. Boats do. Uh, things of, on the boat wear out at different speeds. The, the whole boat thing is very different from the software thing. But I want to talk a little bit about what we do when we build software solutions and how that matches up with what we do when we build marine solutions and how living with software is a lot like living with a boat. And I want to emphasize one thing is there are those people who build software that is, and some of us are guilty of this ourselves, shabby, it works, but you know, there's issues. And a lot of times it works when I use it, but when you use it, there are issues. So the response to the bug report is WFM works for me. That's a, a sure sign of um, shabby software. Some software is just straight up good. It, it does what you expected it to do. It does when you expect it to do it. it, it you, you know it worked because you can see it work. And there's some software that is hand-wringingly overwrought. It's got a kabillion, sometimes 1.2 kabillion extra if statements in there to cover situations that you're not even sure the original author could really fully articulate. What do you think is going to be happening here? And then they'll spin some yarn about what if some evil software genius, just work with me for a minute, what if some evil software genius edited the configuration file so that the imported configurations imported another file and the other file had OS system format in it that formatted the hard drive while it was running, huh? Did you ever think of that? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's Python. I can read the source. I don't need to tweak the configuration file in some deep and mysterious way. I just edit the damn PY file and I am done with it. Your stuff formats the hard drive every time it runs. This is not rocket science. It doesn't require an evil genius to make a mess of things, I think. So when we talk about boats wearing out, let's dig into a little bit of detail on this. Specifically, boats don't just vaguely wear out. They have a very number of, a very specific number of threat scenarios. And often the cybersecurity people like to talk about threat scenarios. Every software application has sort of threat scenarios. Sometimes it's just dumb use cases. A user is going to run it like this and that's stupid. It still is a kind of a threat scenario. It's not like they're trying to steal passwords, but they are going to do something dumb, and they're going to wind up deleting their data sets. So we probably ought to think about that as a threat in broad, vague, using threat in a very vague way. Um, so threat scenarios for boats, you know, uh, corrosion and stuff, electrolysis, um, biological attacks. When you enter the ocean, you enter the food chain, and you are no longer on the top of the food chain. Everything in the ocean is going to eat you. Barnacles. Barnacles are evil little things. It's hard to believe that barnacles can do as much damage as they do. They don't even have a brain or a body. They just have a shell. Um, they're almost as bad as squid. The only good squid's a dead squid. Just remember that every time you order calamari. If it wasn't for us eating calamari, they would have taken over the planet millennia ago. Maybe. Maybe not. 
I want to talk briefly about the uh, cyclic loading issue. You don't think about this when you're gently rocking on the boat in the anchorage. Oh, this is kind of nice. Yeah, every one of those rocks is a boink on a chain and a boink on a chain and a boink on a chain. And so that cyclic loading of years of bouncing back and forth wears out steel parts. It's amazing. Um, and other things, chafe, we'll talk about some of these things, uh, and vibration. Uh, and of course, the crucial and most important thing that is damaging to a boat is dumbassitude, because there are things that you decide that you perhaps should not have decided, and you cause yourself more grief than any other kind of mechanical failure could have caused you. So, boats don't really wear out. They're subject to a variety of very specific threat scenarios, including dumbassitude. So what you have to do when you're looking at boat problems, which is like looking at software problems, you have sort of different ways of approaching the problem. Some things you want to try to prevent by good design, good choice of components, and correct assembly techniques. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Some things you want to defend against. These are the operational things you do every day. You check the oil before you start the engine. Purely a defensive measure because um, there's no prevention that, that will stop the oil from not being there. If it's not there, don't start the engine. It's a decision point. So therefore, it's an operational thing. Therefore, it counts as a defensive measure. And there are some things that are responses to problems where the de preventative thing stopped working, like it wore out or got circumvented. The defensive thing didn't work because you tried but you couldn't. And now you're off into recovery mode where you're going to have to do something to get back into some kind of operational trim. And just, you know, to reinforce the boating thing briefly, um, we look at um, the five F's of safety, flooding, fire, first aid, falling overboard. Um, and anybody who's seen my five F's of uh, functional programming knows that uh, the five F's, uh, five kinds of Python functions, it's not really five, but five such a cool number. There's a lot more than five sort of uh, defensive measures you might get involved in, but it's almost five, and some of them are similar enough to others, and categorization is hard, so I'm not gonna try to classify these properly, but these are things that you wind up having to do, and you have to think about them, and you have to know them, and you have to be able to execute them. And this is where it becomes important. These aren't just sort of arbitrary things in the background. These are things that you have intentionally decided you're going to do. You're going to have fire extinguishers. You're going to have bilge pumps. You're going to make sure the pumps work. As defensive measures, they parallel operational things you do with your application software. Am I going to have logs? Am I going to check the logs? These are active decisions you have to make. And they, you want to automate as much as you can to push things into preventative world, but not everything gets into prevention world. Some things are active defensive measures, stuff you have to actually get off your duff and do once in a while. Um, the other part of thinking about reliable software is somewhere is the edge of the envelope, where beyond this line, with that, actually that line, beyond this line, it's failed. We can't really recover very well. In the case of the boat here, an example thing that's right on the line is when the boat gets physically knocked over, mast laying in the water. This is in the design envelope. The nautical architect, the marine architect, the person who designed the shape of the hull and the rigging knew that getting knocked sideways was a, a thing that can happen rarely and the boat should in principle come back up again because it's got enough mass, uh, well it's no longer below the water line, but it's got enough mass countering the, the mast that it should come back up. Um, on the the trade-off, though, is you can't really prevent a knockdown unless you'd like never take the boat <laughs> into the water, <laughs> because it's always sort of theoretically possible the wind and wave combination is such that the boat's going to get knocked all the way over. Um, 
our, the boat we lived on uh, was knocked over in the Chesapeake Bay. And you don't think of like hurricanes blowing 10 foot seas or 30 foot seas in the Chesapeake Bay. It wasn't, it was actually a derecho wind. Slammed the boat sideways, it fell over in the water, stood back up again when the breeze went by. Um, boat's been through two, it only got knocked over in the one. I was on it the other time and it wasn't that bad because we were lucky. Uh, but there is this recovery issue. When the boat goes slamming over on its side, everything not literally nailed down is going to go flying around the inside of the boat. We use the term not nailed down metaphorically a lot of times. No, this is literally, the floorboards are going to come off the floor. The batteries are going to come out of the engine compartment. This is a dangerous situation, but the boat's going to recover. It's only dangerous for people who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and even then, you're still going to have to put things back together. There's a recovery mode after that thing, but that's inside the design envelope. That was a known situation that could happen. Uh, so we're not talking about weird threat scenarios or bizarre hacker attacks or something like that. It's just, you know, the DDoS of boating. It, it can happen. So what you have to then think about is stuff that gets out into weird attackville or weird failure mode beyond anything that you could initially have thought of. The important thing about beyond the edge of the envelope is the things are not stuff you can rationally foresee, so you can't prevent it. They're things that you can put defensive measures in place so that if it's all kind of going south, you might be able to detect it, but you're going to be in active recovery mode from the real, real weird stuff. And so this thing with a Flask server being started in a Docker container as part of a cron tab, we couldn't figure out why it wouldn't start and run normally. The docker would come up and run for 15 minutes and it'd crash. Come up and run for 15 minutes and crash. And you have very little visibility into this. And the whole notion of having a cron tab start a flask job is like, that's bizarre. Who even thought of doing that? What mindset did... Forget that part of it. We're never going to know. But what we have to do is now patch the damn thing so it'll start correctly and then we can come off after that. Um, so there's a kind of a workaround patch mode. And um, for sailors, that workaround patch mode actually has a formal name. We call it jury rigging. You will jury rig a solution because if you don't jury rig the solution, you're going to die here. So work on it. Um, there are some hugely famous uh, jury rig things. There's some uh, great videos of, of people putting together bizarre, bizarre solutions out of, out of just scraps of parts on their boat and things like that because you want to be able to sail back in. You want to get the engine to run and somebody had a phone, the batteries weren't dead, and they're like, holy cow, you're actually making that work? And yeah, um, the movie Adrift, or whatever it is that came out last December, uh, jury rig uh, a sail out of uh, the whisker pole and get the boat to move and, and successfully get somewhere under that. Um, the uh, Volvo Ocean Race boats, um, this is a bunch of years ago, but they had left Spain and one of the boats, uh, the carbon fiber mast broke. And so you've got the 75 foot boat, a crew of 12, and a mast that's about eight feet tall. And you're essentially in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happens, so now what do you do? Well, you've got a bunch of skilled professional sailors, so you break out the sewing machine and you sew a new sail that's eight feet tall and you rig that thing to the end of the 60 foot long boom and you sail it to Brazil to Brazil from the middle of the ocean because that was the closest point they could get to. That's like heroic, brilliant, oh my God. But it was a jury rig. They had some parts, they had some skills, they put the thing together, they got limping along and, and they were, you know, successful. Uh, they did reasonably well in the rest of the races even though that, that first leg they did <laughs> pretty poorly because their boat got broken, but you know, they did okay. So here we are. Not in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we're just in the Straits of the Florida, between Florida and the Bahamas, um, and it's, it's midnight, and it's, it's dark, and the crew says, I smell diesel fuel, and I, of course, shot my mouth off, being the tech nerd I am. We have a diesel engine. Of course you smell diesel fuel. That's the kind of attitude that'll get you punched. <laughs> Do not mansplain diesel fuel to the crew, never. This is an important lesson. Life lesson, 
never mansplain diesel fuel. So we went through the five F's of safety because this is what we do. Uh, it's, a, it's a smart thing to do. Uh, we're not physically on fire and uh, diesel fuel doesn't burn easily. It, it burns only at huge pressure and huge temperatures, which is why it's really a cool, safe fuel, safer than gasoline. Um, we're not technically flooded. The bilge pumps are working and there isn't that much diesel in the, in, in the deep bilge. We're both here, nobody's fallen overboard and we're not actively falling overboard. We have our offshore harnesses on and our jack lines and we're all safe there. Uh, I'm okay, no first aid required for me. You have to be a little cautious working around diesel engines because uh, diesel fuel's at a huge, huge pressure and it'll, uh, it'll cut you actually if it's spraying uh, because the, the pressure is so high. Um, and it'll take out your eye so you have you know, safety glasses and you have the hair and the turning metal parts and stuff. So there's. But none of that happened. <laughs> um, there's the fatigue question. It's midnight. Are you capable of dealing with this? And the answer is, yeah, I had four hours of good sleep, so I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's, let's start on this. The famine question. There's rice on the stove. You good? I'm good. So we're into fix mode. So what are the pythonic lessons from this? I, I, I got to say, those are some fine looking pictures. Right design, did we design the thing the right way to begin with? Do we know where the design envelope is? What are the situations where this should work correctly, completely? Do we understand that part of it? Right component selection, are we using the right tools for the right job? And this is because we are parts of the Python community, and Python is batteries included computing. And oh my god, the standard library may be big, but the whole Python ecosystem is vast beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. You have to choose wisely. And then there's the Python 2 question, which anybody here still using Python 2? I will shame you publicly if you still are. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, a proper assembly technique in the boating thing, because of cyclic loading and the vibration and, and, uh, and, and the remote possibility of uh, having to work in, in a, a wet environment, um, assembly is really, really important. A lot of stainless steel parts and stuff is, is, is essential. And you know you don't just have wires randomly. They have to be supported and stuff like that. Um, and in Python world, that assembly thing also applies because we are gluing together software components. And we have to be cognizant of the interfaces among among those software components and there are some things we can do and we know because we've done them that are a little sketchy where I'm just gonna quickly put this little JSON file into this other thing and the other thing's actually expecting YAML but because JSON's a subset of YAML it's gonna work okay and then it's gonna turn it into a CSV and eventually this is all gonna fit together. Uh, could we have maybe cut some of the middle stuff out and just glued them together correctly like they're supposed to be glued together? Right assembly is as much a part of right component selection, is as much a part of right design. Uh, all of it's sort of got to be there if you want to have something survivable. So design-wise, um, I mentioned the standard libraries. I think it's really, really important to understand what's available in the standard library and choose wisely when you're not using something that's already part of the standard library. I'm, I'm kind of biased that way. For the proper data science, though, you know, NumPy and Pandas and the stuff we use all the time, scikit-learn, they're not in the standard library. Uh, so, you know, we're already outside the trivial case and into the interesting case. So you have to think carefully there. But What's really important is the not inventing a new wheel. This has to be done judiciously. And so you will hear people give presentations about a dumb idea they had. That's not without value uh, because the dumb ideas are not without value. But the question is, in some cases, why start down that road in the first place? There's stuff that's available. There's stuff that's widely used. It's got a million stars on GitHub. Maybe it's better to do that than invent your own. Um, uh, I, I'm always uh, suspicious you know, in the um, sprint planning when somebody says, well, we're just going to build this and it'll be great. Yeah, but there's stuff that's a lot like that. Why is this so much better? Uh, these are valuable conversations to have. 
So boating wise, you know, there's a bunch of choices that have to be made. You're buying high tensile strength steel and you're using nylon and stuff like that. Um, the, my boat has five sails, so I've got tons and tons of nylon line everywhere. Um, our ground tackle is, you know, this combination of chain and rope so that we have a lot of weight at one end and not much weight at the other end. Uh, zinc anodes in order to make sure that electrolysis doesn't happen and things like that. Uh, the, the, the biocide paint to make sure the barnacles don't eat any more of the boat than they're supposed to. And these are all essentially component selection things. You buy the right parts, you buy them from a known marine place, and you put them together the right way. This isn't that hard to do. It's actually kind of fun. Uh, I mentioned that, that there's a fatigue and chafe issue that you got to make Make sure everything's anchored correctly and you've got to use all the right sort of seizing and uh, if you're tying stuff together with ropes you got to use the right knots and whatnot there's a lot to it um, it's not that difficult to do and it's a lot like ordinary programming in that there are these specific programming techniques data structures algorithms apis these are all the ordinary skills that you build up using tools like Python, and you just have to execute them reasonably well each time. Uh, when you go through pull request design reviews and, and discussions with other people, you improve your skills each time and do a better job of assembly the next time. Um, the, the same thing is true for, for putting stuff together on a boat. And you have some other higher level more powerful tools available to validate that you're doing things the right way. You know, you use PyLint or PyFlake, you use uh, MyPy. Um, I used to be a, um, a big uh, unit test person, but I switched over to PyTest and I'm really happy I did. So you, you put all of these things together to, uh, you know, make sure that you've assembled your code correctly. Big fan of type hints. Anybody else here? I asked earlier or yesterday about who's using type hints. A couple of people are. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, um, you, there are some things that are very difficult to do with type, to, to describe with type hints, and it's sort of okay to, to take a step back from the really hard edge cases. If you're gonna invent a new kind of decorator, for instance, you're gonna discover that type hints for decorators is its own weird world of meta descriptions, of abstract descriptions, of class, uh, callable objects that call callable objects and stuff. It's brutal to, to get the type hints right. Uh, but for other more ordinary things, you know, it takes in an integer and a float and it produces a string. This isn't rocket science. You give it to MyPy, and MyPy says, you know, on line 152, you're giving it a tuple. No, I'm not. Oh, wait, I am. No, I'm not. No, no, that's not a tuple. That's, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Hmm. Hmm. I hate you, MyPy. This code passed unit test. This code passed unit test, 80% code coverage, and now my pie is coming at me? Oh no, oh no, oh no. We're not putting up with that any longer than we have to. I'm gonna take out the type ins. I'm gonna cross that stuff right off before I listen to my pie telling me that's not gonna work. Oh, but then when you put the other unit test case in, yeah, it does break. All right, fine, so my pie can be right once in a while. I have to mention this because it, 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 um, it was something that I thought was a really good idea when I started using Python 20 years ago was, oh, I can put assertions everywhere. What a dumb idea. The, don't put assertions everywhere. When you do use assertions, do not assert types ever. Um, it is a needless restriction on, on, on what things are going to happen. Uh, MyPy will check your types for you more. Uh, more adroitly than, than assertions ever will. And because you can turn assertions off um, with the optimization switch, it, they're, they're, um, they have a place and the place is in the unit testing framework. And that's where they belong. PyTest uses assertions. That's the right place for them. Use them very, very wisely. So the other part of this, beside choosing the right components, having a good design, and doing good assembly is knowing where the edge of the envelope is and where you have crossed over the line from ordinary operations into this is so dumb, I'm not going to try to prevent it. I'm just going to crash elaborately. There is nothing more useful than a loud, elaborate failure with a full traceback and SNS notifications if you use Amazon Cloud or emails or whatever you got to do to tell people that we died here for a good reason. And the good reason is somebody did the wrong thing. And um, th that is a very, very helpful thing to do. So you have two subcases there. One is it's scary and weird 
but it's still legit operations. And then there's the other one, which is, I believe we're sinking. And I believe it's time to get the ditch bag and the um, inflatable um, life raft ready. And you need to make that decision uh, carefully. Uh, and in some cases, there's this straddly thing where I think we can fix it, but if we can't get the ditch bag ready. No, I think it's almost fixed. Oh, no, no, ditch bag. So these are, these are touchy situations, and, and it, it, you have to acknowledge them. And you have to build software that works well under all of those circumstances. And we'll talk about this just a little bit uh, in a moment here. The trick is to think about where that worst case is that's still inside the envelope. That I'm willing to go this far and we ought to be able to recover and everything ought to be normal. Here, you're gonna have to do some heroic stuff to get the database squared away and we're gonna have to roll back some transactions. I don't know what's gonna happen. And here, everything is so corrupt that we're gonna have to just go back to the other server uh, because I can't, I, we can't make this work anymore. And so you're talking about some detection you're talking about some ordinary defensive measures to get things under control, and you're also talking about having a way when you're in that recovery mode to do meaningful recovery steps that aren't a first-class part of the operation. They're sort of this weird extra tier of hackery, but it's hackery that you thought about. There is an interface for that. There is a way to put this module together. You could have a little spike thing over here saying, you know, if it gets really dicey, here's this thing you can do. This thing calls that thing, doesn't use the filter, and you can still process some data, but, but you're gonna have erroneous transactions go through. Maybe that's not a wrong thing to have available. Exposing some of the internal componentry designing your classes in a way that they can be combined flexibly, thinking about functional composition of what if I need to leave this out or what if I need to plug something in in kind of an emergency where I'm just gonna write a couple of lines of code and slap it in there and it ought to work. Um, it means that you sort of think about doc tests greater than greater than greater than example a little more seriously saying, well, wait, if we're in recovery mode, somebody really is literally going to be typing at the greater than, greater than, greater than prompt, import this, import this other thing, define this function, and it should run. And that may be part plus you, part of your recovery plan is that this stuff is actually kind of supported. It's at the edge of the envelope. Only do it if you're recovering for an emergency, but it is something that we thought about when we were designing the software in the first place. So, in, uh, in the case of things like boats, we have, as a defensive measure, bilge pumps, and you can see that I've got a, like a cabillion hoses there, but they're held together with hose clamps. I can, with a screwdriver, take this apart and reassemble the plumbing if it got to that case. I, I kind of wish it wouldn't ever get to that case, but remember, this is what I woke up to at midnight. <laughs> I smell burning diesel. Thank you, thank you, Commodore. So, let us review, did we detect it? Yes, we did. It was a smell, not a code smell metaphorically, it was a literal smell, but I mean the whole code smell, burning diesel smell, come on, this is the where we live. We look at something and we say, hmm, your code has a kind of a burning diesel smell about it. Is this the right thing? Is this what we should do? Operationally, software will have smells where but it's the third time we've seen that exception this week. Hmm, what was the last thing we did? Was that a patch? Was that a proper release? Is something changed in our user community? Is that just that one guy who always does the one bad thing or is this something else going on? You know, there's a smell. You probably ought to respond to it. Detection is difficult and you don't want to have too many alarms because then it becomes like noisy and disturbing. But on the other hand, you want to have enough alarms that you can say, hmm, hmm. I don't think this is right. What, what should be going on here? What should be different? So we detected it. 
Can we jury rig around it? It's the damn fuel line to the damn diesel engine. There is no bypassing it. If we bypass it, we drift in the um, Gulf Stream and we wind up in Beaufort, North Carolina if we're lucky in two weeks. Um, so no, no, we, there is no bypass for this thing. There is no jury rig. And in this case, uh, the rescue tape, uh, diesel fuel is basically kerosene. It's like a solvent. And so the rescue tape was just sliding off and I'm down there putting tape on as this thing's thundering away and the diesel spraying on the block and it slips down and it, you know, a couple of those tries and like, all right, that's not working. So now the question is, should we shut down the engine? Well, if you do, the fuel's gonna leak out the hole and we're gonna have air in there and air in a diesel fuel line is a huge pain in the neck. I don't wanna have to bleed the engine. We're not losing that much fuel, so let's just leave a run. So now the question is, where can we limp to? And the answer was Stewart, Florida, uh, not too far away and you know, you're at 1 a.m. or 1.30 a.m. looking at the uh, computerized chart plotter trying to figure out what the closest spot in Florida you can get to is. And, um, and then the one other thing was to kill a circuit breaker on the bilge pump so that we didn't turn this into an environmental disaster by pumping diesel fuel overboard from our boat because that's only a $10,000 fine. <laughs> we did have to clear customs. That was awkward and confusing because we're trying to get in <laughs> to this thing in Florida. We've been up all night and uh, you know, and the, of course the engine's not right and the Coast Guard wants to board our boat and inspect it. And like, oh my God, not now, this is not, but what else are you gonna do? So, okay, come on, bring the guns, inspect the boat, whatever you guys gotta do, make yourselves happy. <clears throat> So you need to be able to detect the problems more than just a smell, some logging, some alerts, some filters, Splunk, Datadog, whatever you got for detection. Employ it liberally because uh, you can't go too far wrong. Just have it filterable and silenceable when the errors don't make sense. Sometimes you'll put stuff in as a release and it turns out it's not really helpful. You maybe want to take it out or silence it. Um, like the Python warnings module, some things you don't need to hear about every single time. Some things you do because they're, they're legit. You need to be able to respond to it and so you need to be able to make decisions, make stuff work. And I've highlighted in red here, top level CLI scripting. I'm a firm, firm believer because I'm old in having some kind of CLI capability and I don't care what your thing is. If it could be a, a, a very fancy um, single page app where you've got a really cool API server that coughs out some JavaScript code that does the rest of the work, I still think in the background you ought to have some CLI tools to square away state user access controls, security provisions, API keys, all the other stuff ought to be done outside the user's view of the world, that in the back I've got this thing. And the thing that I've got in the back, the CLI, probably ought to be very carefully secured because you don't want a back door that any idiot can get at. You probably want a CLI that can only be used by a few users who log in to just the right account with the SSHs with the certificate you gave them so that only a few people on the planet can use the CLI, but the fact remains they can use the CLI. They have access to get at the things behind the hood, under the hood, in the engine room, rebuild the stuff just to get limping so that we're not completely dead in the water, we're not compromising people's uh, personal information, we're not giving away credit card numbers or some other foolishness, but we have control over it. So limping home, jury rigging is important and I emphasize uh, a CLI script that you probably ought to do it. So when you're building things like web servers, have a CLI capability. Flask does this for free. Uh, it's not difficult to do, so uh, do it. Um, make sure that there are potentially reusable components. The whole point of microservices is to not have monoliths. The whole point of Python is to not have giant monolithic piles of code. You're importing different modules. Bust your modules down a little bit include some higher level access, maybe some functions, maybe some class definitions, so that from the greater, greater, greater prompt, you can actually do some meaningful stuff. Recover your database, reset your credentials, turn stuff back off again so that you have control over what's going on. 
th th these are three um, essentially identical boats all on one mooring ball in uh, Vero Beach. That's um, uh, about 100,000 pounds of boat or something like that uh, tied to that ball. The good news is that it's way inland, so you don't get any, any uh, a big breeze. But uh, w when we put the third boat on there, uh, we were all scratching our heads going, you know, the marina management people are going to hate us if something happens. Because <laughs> those, are, those are right big boats, and that's not a right big ball. Software doesn't break, doesn't wear out. When you uncover a problem, the problem had already been there and has always been there. This sometimes is a troubling thing because you uncover it and then you say, oh drat, how much of the database has corrupt? How long has this been going on? Uh, so that's an unpleasant thing and it means that ordinary defensive programming, adding a bunch of rando assert statements and stuff like that isn't going to help. It's not going to um, solve the problem. It's not going to prevent the problem. It's just going to add a lot of code that makes perhaps detection more difficult. So um, don't get too involved in the defensive programming because you're going to have to patch it. You're going to have to put out a repair. You may have to redo some of the stuff in the database when you figure out the extent of the damage. But all of that activity is colored by certain knowledge that the bug was always there. It just took you a while to discover it. Important rule. It didn't wear out. It was always broken. So the other thing is explicitly empower the capability of jury rigging your stuff. Make your components reusable, make your components recombinable. Think through the beyond the edge of the envelope scenario saying, well, you know, if everything goes to hell, here's what we can do. We can this and we can that and we'll get it back up and running again. That's not a bad thing. The fact that you can think through it means you've put the software together in a way that that recombination, that jury rigging is possible. That is the right way to design software as reusable components, recombinable. We are always taught that anyway. We just don't often think about the idea of jury rig and linking, limping home. But you can think about me in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean trying to get my engine back together again. You're talking about operational sort of runtime tweaks and repairs and things like that. You always want to prevent, I mean, duh. So you want to make sure that you've done right design, you've selected the right components, and you've assembled things the right way. That there's, you know, that this is, um, uh, you know, motherhood and apple pie. This is what you're supposed to have been doing, but it doesn't always work that way. So make sure that you have thought carefully about detecting the problem, Make sure that you have thought carefully about what you're gonna to do to maybe work in a degraded mode if that's what you need to do. And how do we abandon ship? What is the process for rolling back to the previous version? Where is the old database? What are the old database credentials? What happens when we go back to version 1.1 and we're using the 1.1 database and all the transactions aren't there anymore? How do we tell the pissed off users that the stuff you did last week is gone forever because of some other problem? It, it's a thought exercise. You may never have to do it, but you should think about degraded mode. What will our failover be? How do we abandon ship? What order do we get things from below? Where is our wallet and our passport? Is it in the ditch bag at all times? Really awkward. It's just a weekend. I'm just going sailing. Where does the wallet go? It goes in the waterproof bag as a matter of discipline so that you always know where your wallet is. It's in the waterproof bag so that when we leave the boat, that bag goes first. Life raft goes second. The one on the left is not my boat. In fact, none of those are my boat. These were all taken from my boat. These were just, you know, if anybody's been to Annapolis, you'll recognize the, the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Well, thank you very much. I hope you have uh, begun to think a little bit about how you might be jury rigging, how you might be limping home, how you might be detecting problems. And we, we will talk anon. Um, we're gonna have lightning talks, and then we're gonna have social hour uh, at the beer garden, and uh, I will meet you out in the hall.
Thank you.